Welcome to Hear the Word of God, the online and broadcast teaching ministry of the Rev. Eric Alexander. By and large, the book of Revelation is neglected by the great majority of Christian people, often because it's extremely difficult to understand in places, and we recognize that. But at the other pole, there are those who are obsessed with the book of Revelation, who believe that it is probably the only part of Scripture that is supremely relevant to this particular age in which we live. And down through the ages, people have been like that. They have felt that their generation has seen in the book of Revelation their own particular period of history being fulfilled and no one else's. And there are all sorts of ways in which people have become obsessed with the book of Revelation for the wrong reasons. I was suggesting to you, therefore, that these three avenues that we are given speak to us about the right approach to the book of Revelation. First, it is a letter, a genuine, true letter from the Apostle John, as I believe, to these seven churches, which are real churches in Asia, going through a period of intense oppression, spiritual oppression, physical persecution under the reign of the Emperor Domitian, There was wave after wave of bloody persecution in the early church. And many of these people's contemporaries, their families, had died under this oppression. And they are therefore being written to by the Apostle John. And do you notice he is writing to them for the practical pastoral purpose of encouraging them. He is not playing tricks with symbolisms to them or presenting religious or theological puzzles to them. He is writing with the specific purpose of encouraging them in the midst of their trials and difficulties. This is why he says, for example, in verse 9, I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. I was on the island of Patmos. Now they knew very well precisely why he was there. And this letter, not just this part of it, nor the seven letters to the churches that we know quite well in chapters 2 and 3, but the whole book of Revelation is in the nature of a letter to these seven churches and beyond them to us. But the really important thing about interpreting the book of Revelation, therefore, is that we need to ask the same question that we need to ask with any part of Scripture when we are interpreting it. What did it mean to those to whom it was originally addressed? Now, whenever you have some idea of interpreting the book of Revelation in a way that would mean nothing to the people to whom it was originally addressed, you should be suspicious of that interpretation because it must mean something vital to the people originally addressed by the Apostle John. And as he is addressing them in uh, this letter that he writes to them, he is addressing them as one who is himself uh, experiencing the suffering and the trials that they themselves are going through. I was suggesting to you also that it is a, a prophecy and it originally is therefore a word, and this is one of the significances of it being a prophecy, that comes from God himself. That's the thing about a prophecy. It comes directly from God through the prophet to the people and is therefore of supernatural origin. It is, uh, for this reason, in verse 2, not only a prophecy, it is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So it has supernatural origin 
and is the voice and word of God himself. Now, the idea of Revelation being prophecy, if I may just um, tax you a little bit, and it may be important to some and less important to others to, to get hold of this. The idea of Revelation being prophecy is important for a number of reasons. One of them we touched on last week, that is that the prophet not only foretells the future, which he most certainly does, and any suggestion that there is no supernatural forth foretelling of the future is due largely to a presupposition that it is impossible for somebody to foretell the future. That's why you find that prophetic foretelling in the Bible is treated with suspicion by secular people and by secularly minded theologians. But we are dealing with a God who is the creator and controller of the past and the present and the future. And therefore, it is possible for somebody like Isaiah to look into the future several centuries in advance and see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ from eight centuries before. Now, of course, the reason people will tell you that in Isaiah 53, Isaiah cannot possibly be speaking about Christ, is that eight centuries intervene. But of course, the prophet is one who foretells the future given to him by God. But he also foretells, that is, he speaks to his own generation and John in Revelation is acting as a prophet in that sense. He is both addressing his own generation and he is foretelling the future. But there's another reason that it's important to grasp that Revelation is prophecy. Revelation is prophecy in this sense that frequently people would categorize the book of Revelation as what is called, and this may not be of great interest to some of you, but it's important for others, I think, apocalyptic. Now, you may know that the very first word of Revelation chapter 1, the word, the revelation of John, is in the form in which the Greek would have spoken, the Apocalypse of John. And you sometimes find the title, in fact, Professor Torrance's commentary on Revelation is called The Apocalypse. And there is an adjective from that, apocalyptic writing, and there are many apocalyptic writings, most of which you will find in the Apocrypha, now, most of you will know that in some Bibles there are bound together not only the text of Holy Scripture, but books of the Apocrypha. Very interesting that uh, most of them are called by the name of some distinguished uh, figure from the past like uh, Enoch, Abraham, Esdras, so on. Now, apocalyptic writing was a form of literature which was familiar in the Old Testament, and there are marks of it in some of the books of the Bible, such as the book of Daniel, where you find that there are these visions marked by extraordinary symbolism, some of it sometimes almost grotesque. But apocalyptic literature is marked by several things. It's marked by being rich in mysteries, sometimes somewhat bizarre symbolisms. It was written under an assumed name like Enoch or Abraham, Mesdras, or so on. And the key to it is often given by um, an angelic personage, as you find, for instance, is true here and there in Revelation. But there is a distinction between the traditional apocalyptic literature and the book of Revelation. 
Apocalyptic literature is usually pessimistic about the future, whereas Revelation is realistic but ultimately optimistic about the future. It recognizes God's rule over the world, which is not ultimately in the hands of the forces of darkness, but in the hands of God. So although it is true to say that this book is called the Apocalypse, it needs to be distinguished from other apocalyptic literature outside of the canon of Holy Scripture and to be recognized more truly as prophetic literature John speaks as a prophet, and you will notice that it's not anonymous eh, or written under another name, as they say, pseudonymous. Um, it is written by John under his own name. Now, I mention that just for the sake of those of you who may know something about it. If all of that doesn't mean anything to you, kindly forget about it and come back and concentrate with me now on important things. Above all other things, the Apostle John has a theological argument with which he wants to strengthen his fellow believers. And that theological argument is very simple, you will be relieved to hear, because the theological argument is simply Jesus. This is how he is going to strengthen his fellow believers in the midst of trials and tribulations and days of great pain and even facing death itself. And you will notice from verse 5 how he does this. He answers four questions. Who Jesus is, that's verse 5, the first part anyway. Secondly, what Jesus has done, that's verses 5 and 6. Thirdly, what Jesus will do. And fourthly, that's verse 7. Fourth, <coughs> fourthly, what Jesus is doing now, that's from verse 9 through to the end. We looked uh, touching upon that last part as we finished our introduction last week. Let me then come with you to these four great questions that John the Apostle answers concerning the one who is the real reply from God, God's balm, God's word of grace to the souls of his needy people in the midst of all the pressures and trials of their experience. First, who Jesus is. And you will notice again and again as we go through this how he is applying the truth about Jesus, which is what theology is after all. He is applying the truth about Jesus to their lives in a specific way. Now verse 5, he says, uh, or halfway through verse 4, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. Uh, most scholars think that that is a reference to God the Father uh, and is probably connected to the holy name of God that we have been looking at in the book of Exodus. I am that I am. He is the one who is, who was, and who is to come. That's God the Father. And from the seven spirits, or as I was suggesting to you, you might want to look at the NIV margin, from the sevensfold spirit, with a capital S, that is God the Holy Spirit. And now the third member of the Trinity comes in this greeting of grace and peace to you from him who is and was and is to come, that's the Father, from the sevenfold Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. 
Now notice how he describes the Lord Jesus Christ. Under these terms, he is first of all the faithful witness. Now you may possibly know that the term for witness in the New Testament is exactly our English word martyr. That is where the word martyr comes from. It is just a simple transliteration. Martyr is witness. And when he says he is bringing them this prophecy from him who is the faithful witness, he is speaking of the one who has given himself. He has witnessed a good confession. And he has done so by giving himself in death, as we shall see in a moment, for his people. So the way that they are treading in martyrdom, as they are being asked to pay what we call the supreme sacrifice, is a way that the Lord Jesus Christ has already trodden before them. He has gone there in this way of being a faithful witness, neither turning to the right hand nor to the left. Now, this is the great testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ's life, you will recollect. And what God is saying to these people when He calls them on stage by stage is you are to follow the example of the Lord Jesus who would not be deflected from obedience to his Father's will, because this is the great temptation of people in days of pressure and persecution and opposition and pain and possible death, that they would be deflected from obedience. Now, secular history tells us that that's precisely what was happening to these people. They were being threatened with all sorts of things if they remained faithful promised all kinds of things if they would abandon their faithfulness. Now, here this prophecy comes from him who is the faithful witness, who did not turn aside, even when Simon Peter comes to him and says, This be far from you, Lord, all this talk of sacrifice and self-offering. And Jesus says, Get behind me, Satan. When they cried to him, come down from the cross if you are the Christ, whose voice do you think that was? It was from the same source to deflect him from faithfulness. Now the Lord Jesus is declared here to be the faithful and the true one. And it is in that category that he is described. He is precisely the one who has left his footprint on the pathway of faithfulness unto death. And that was no mere talk for John's contemporaries. This was the bitterest reality. Being faithful unto death and he will give you a crown of life is what they were speaking about as their experience. My dear brothers and sisters, we know very little of this sort of thing in our Christian living. Is it not true? We speak about opposition, and it's very real, and about persecution, and that can be very real for many people. But faithfulness unto death is something that... Very few of us know. I remember before he died, speaking to Festo Kivengeri, who was a bishop in the Anglican Church in Uganda, known to some of you, and he told us about a number of people who were actually standing, being commanded by one of the army officers to deny Christ and blaspheme his name and spit upon his Bible, and they refused to do so. 
And they became faithful unto death before Festic Avenger's eyes. Some of them, people he had led to Christ. Can you imagine that? And they were hacked with machetes to death and dispatched into the next world. Now that's something we know so little about in our own experience. We talk about the cost of discipleship. But the one who is the faithful and true, he witnessed a good confession. But he is not only the the faithful witness, he is the firstborn from the dead, do you notice? Now, here again, do you see how he is pastorally applying truth to their souls and spirits and troubled minds, the firstborn from the dead. Now, there are two things about the firstborn, which are so obvious, I almost insult you by mentioning them, but you will see the significance of them. The firstborn is the one who carried authority. That's the significance of being the firstborn. The firstborn was the one who bore authority. And so Jacob and Esau were related as they were because one of them was the firstborn. And Esau sold that right for a mess of pottage. Well, now, here is this glorious thing, you see, that uh, we have here this amazing situation where our Lord Jesus Christ is the firstborn, the one who has supreme and absolute authority. And he demonstrated that authority in his resurrection in the ultimate sphere by demonstrating his authority over death. Death yielded to him. Death could not hold him. And there is the first area where the firstborn is significant. He has authority, and here he has authority over death. But you notice the other thing about being the firstborn. It's intrinsic to the idea that the firstborn has other brothers and sisters who follow him. Isn't that right? He would be the only child otherwise, but he's the firstborn. And what the apostle is saying is he has other sons and daughters of God who are his brothers and sisters whom he is taking to glory and they too inherit the same glorious victory over death and every lesser enemy because he has risen from the dead. So he is the faithful witness. He is the firstborn from the dead. You notice the other title that's given to him in verse 4. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. No matter which Caesar, Domitian, or Nero, or whoever may strut the stage of human history and imagine himself to be all-powerful, and use that power for the exhibition of his own cruelty, the apostle says to them, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Do you know that marvelous occasion when Andrew Melville, you know Andrew Melville, John Knox's successor, who was the principal of Glasgow University, and for some obscure reason left it to become the principal of St. Andrew's University. But he became principal of both, and he was one of the people who had an amazing impact upon King James the Sixth of Scotland and First uh, of Scotland and England. And uh, he went into the presence of King James the Sixth, and he says this to him, when James the Sixth is demanding to have the right to rule in Christ's church as well as in the nation, Andrew Melville says to him, I have told you before, and I tell you again, this is to a king, you know, none of your majesty here, it appears. I told you before, he says, 
And I tell you again, there are two kings and two kingdoms in Scotland. There is the King James who is the head of the commonwealth. And there is King Jesus of whom King James is a subject. And that is the position of every king and every ruler and of every man or woman who seeks to bear authority. Jesus Christ is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And the implication is, you see, here again you notice the pastoral application of the truth. He is saying, let all tyrants tremble because Jesus Christ is king and he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. So that is who Jesus is. We dare not miss the truth of these words. He is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the rulers of the kings of the earth. Notice, secondly, what he has done. Verse 5, uh, halfway through the verse at the beginning of the new paragraph in the NIV, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins, he is almost, you would think, moving directly from the initial greeting to the closing doxology, and you would almost think he was finished. But what he is now caught up with is the glory of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done, and it only goes into the language of doxology for the apostle. To him who loves us, not loved us, as some translations have it, but loves us, it's present tense, and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. Now notice the point of this. Again, you see pastorally. What he is recognizing is that the world may hate them. They may experience the bitterness of the hatred of all the opposition. But, he says, the thing that matters above all else is that he has set his love upon you. He who is the ruler of the kings of the earth has set his love upon you and loves us and has demonstrated that love in the most remarkable way. He has freed us from our sins by his blood. Now, that, you see, was what enabled them to face death. Above everything else, what enables somebody to face death with equanimity is this knowledge that they have been freed from their sins by the blood of Jesus. Because all of us have guilt and shame and a conscience that accuses us. And you know how we will say to people sometimes if they have been guilty of something that is outrageous, I do not know how he can live with his conscience. But what the Apostle John is speaking about here is not living with your conscience, but dying with your conscience. And the reason they are able to face death with peace and grace and joy is that he loves us. He continues to do so and nothing in heaven or earth or hell will change the reality of the love of Jesus. And he has freed us from our sins by his blood. So the Christian is more free in his prison bonds than his captors in their apparent freedom. You notice this? 
Here is another pastoral medicine for the souls of God's people, the love of Christ, the redeeming work that he has accomplished by his blood. He loves us. He has set us free. And he has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. It may be that the translation should be, he has made us a kingdom of priests. That is, he has given to us the highest and most noble of tasks and ministries and privileges. That is, to serve or worship his God and Father. Do you notice, just in passing, the ultimate aim of our Lord Jesus Christ? His ultimate aim is not to relieve us of our unhappiness, although redeeming grace frequently does that. His ultimate aim is not even the forgiveness of our sins. His ultimate aim is to produce a kingdom of priests. That's the priesthood of all believers whose life will be noted for glorifying and worshiping and honoring and praising the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is what redemption is for. It is for worship. Thirdly, what will Jesus do? Verse 7. Look, he is coming again, the present continuous tense. He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him, so shall it be. Amen. Now, this is one of several references in the book of Revelation to the return of Christ. Very important to notice that as such, it is not true to say, but every page of the book of Revelation is about the return of Christ. Not immediately, actually. Here he says, Lo, he is coming. But it is not true that on every page that is what the apostle is saying to us. Of course, the thought of his coming triumph runs through the entire book and the implication of what he says at the beginning of verse 7 is the background to it because it is the background of all history. That history is not running round in circles. History is going in a particular direction. You know, there are many people who imagine, and some people have written extensive books on the circular nature of history. One of them says, for this reason... History teaches us that history teaches us nothing. History is going round in circles, he is saying. That is not what Scripture tells us. History is going in a particular direction, moving towards what the Bible calls the day, the great and awful day of the Lord. And as a background, to life and all our thinking about history, there is this truth. He is coming. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means simply he is on the way. That's what he's saying. He is on the way, he says. You realize this is the ultimate truth about history that Christ Jesus, who loves us, and has washed us from our sins, and made made us a kingdom and priests 
unto God his Father that we might serve him. He is on the way back to this world. Now that's a vital thing for people who are in the midst of pressures and trials and distresses. They sometimes feel bereft and left. They sometimes feel there is no meaning to life. That people are getting off scot-free with murdering multitudes of God's people and oppressing more of them. And what the apostle says is, he is on the way, he is coming. But only the eye of faith knows that. That's why he says he is coming with clouds. It's the eye of faith that is able to penetrate into the, cl the clouds by the truth of God. And to say he is coming. And with his coming, there is coming a day. The day when his enemies will have to look into these burning eyes we read about last Wednesday and see him in his glory. And this, he says, is something that no human being will escape. Every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. Now, how then are they to think about their oppressors? Not primarily with godless anger, Isn't it an amazing thing how some of these people in Uganda, because I suppose that's the nearest in history to us of real oppression, how they looked at those who were about to hack them to bits, and they said, we love you because our Savior loves you. So the way to respond to them is not with godless anger, nor with godless envy, as sometimes we can do. Do you not find that's a reality in a godless world? Here are the powerful, the prosperous, those who apparently get off with sin, with impunity. And we say, how extraordinary the godly live in days of difficulty and persecution deprived in so many ways, he says, they are not to be viewed with anger or envy, but with pity. Because the day is coming when they will see him. Now lastly, and we really looked at this last week, what Jesus is doing now John says that on the Lord's day, that's significant too, incidentally, because you know there was a day that was marked in pagan celebration as Caesar's day. And the Christians established the Lord's day. And on the Lord's day, he says, I was in the Spirit and heard behind me a loud voice, and he sees this figure we concentrated on for a little last week, the picture of the unveiled Christ, no longer Christ veiled in flesh, no longer Christ in his humiliation, but Christ in his exalted glory. And John tells us he cannot bear the sight. He fell down as though dead because of the burning glory of the Son of God. But you notice where he is walking. And here again is the remarkable thing. 
He is walking amongst the seven golden lampstands. And the seven golden lampstands are, of course, the seven churches. We are told about this. The seven lampstands at the very end of the chapter are the seven churches, and there are seven stars. These are the angels of the seven churches. We don't think too much about angels today, but what he is saying is that there is an angel. I don't think they were the ministers of the seven churches. Some people say these are the ministers of the seven churches. An angelic figure would hardly represent the minister of the seven churches, would he? But he says... These are the angels. They are real angels. Do you remember how the Lord Jesus found this in his testing? That God the Father didn't send his disciples to him in the wilderness. He sent the angels to minister to him and to his beleaguered people in the church There is an angel sent to each of them. But the Lord himself is in the midst of them. And he is the one, he says, who is living and was dead, and I am alive forevermore, and I hold the keys. I hold the keys of death and hell. Pilate didn't know that, did he, when uh, Jesus stood before him and he said, Do you not know who I am? These little jumped-up officials like Pilate, they are always very careful that people should know who they are. And he said, Do you not know who I am? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? And Jesus said to him, You don't have any power at all except it were given to you by my Father. That's what makes strong men and women out of weaklings. That's what puts backbone into Christian living and behavior. That the one who loves us and has freed us from our sins holds the keys of death, and hell and he will never abdicate his throne let's pray together Lord Jesus we bow before you and acknowledge how great you are how great is your glory how great is your love How great your redeeming grace. There is nothing that your children will need in this life that is not to be found in you. And we pray that we may glory in the Lord Jesus Christ and in nothing else in the world that we may live for you. May your grace and mercy and peace be our portion this night and always. Amen. You're listening to Hear the Word of God with the Rev. Eric Alexander, a minister in the Church of Scotland for over 50 years. To access more Bible teaching from Rev. Alexander, visit hearthewordofgod.org, where your generous contribution will help us sustain and grow this ministry. That's hearthewordofgod.org. You could choose instead to mail a check to this address, 600 Eden Road, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, 17601, or call 1-800-488-1888. This program is a presentation of the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. I'm Mark Daniels. Thank you for listening. Please join us again next time for Eric Alexander and Hear the Word of God.